Welcome to 3ABN Today. My name is C.A. Murray, and allow me once again to thank you for sharing just a little of your day with us, to thank you for your prayers, your support of this ministry, and for all that you do to help us do what we are called to do, and that's to lift up the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm excited today for a number of reasons. One, I like, and I'll use the term alternative ministries or out-of-the-box ministries or non-traditional ministries. I like the idea that God is calling in these last days men and women of considerable talent to use those talents for the lifting up of the kingdom of God. Um, all of the ministry is not being done in the pulpit. In fact, I dare say more ministry is done outside of the pulpit than in the pulpit. And God is using particular niche ministries. He's calling people to do what they can do to take Christ to areas that he may not normally be found. And, and, and one of those persons is, is Chris Lang. Chris, good to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Good looking guy. And he is, he, he's a filmmaker. Uh, and I like the idea. I'm very impressed that God is using film along with other kinds of ministries to tell people about Jesus Christ. We are a, a visual video uh, population now. We're in that age when people want to see it even more than they want to read it or want to hear it. And so God is calling people out of the world and into his kingdom to lift up Jesus and to take Jesus back to that same world and put it before the eyes, the ears, the hearts, uh, the minds of people who, who need to hear about Jesus. And Chris is one of those guys doing precisely that. Good to have you here, man. Thank you, C.A. Before we go to our music, I want to get a little background on you. Where are you from? I'm originally from Loma Linda, California. Aha, uh -huh. Adventist ghetto, dare I say. Yes, sir. That's right. <laughs> Did you grow up in the church Adventist family? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I grew up in an Adventist Christian family, uh -huh. uh, three siblings. Uh, grew up in a musical family. My mother was a music teacher, a choir director. Aha. Uh -huh. And I had a sensitivity for the Word of God at a very young age. Aha, uh -huh. praise the Lord. Now, of the three, where are you in that? that uh, I'm the baby. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. The baby, if, if you read... Um, uh, some of the things on, 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 on uh, kids, particularly the baby, tends to be the one that can go off in any direction. You know, uh, you may have the first two sort of following, and then that, that, that third one can do anything. That's the one that kind of surprises you. Sometimes great things good, sometimes great things bad. Uh, but uh, you never can tell where that last one is going to go. Um, when did it occur to you that you needed or you had a personal savior. At what point did you sort of lock down on Jesus? You know, CA, my my journey started very young. Mm -hmm. And I think the sensitivity about a savior who who died for me and who um, who came to create a future, a future hope mm -hmm. for my life um, and a purpose for my personal life mm. really happened in this context when my parents told me my birth story. Aha. Uh -huh. And we have a, a short little clip that actually um, helps to illustrate the way that God reached down into the darkness uh -huh. to save my life. Praise the Lord. Let's take a look. My mother had a miscarriage. What she didn't know was that she had twins. I was that other twin, still inside her womb. Now there was no ultrasound in those days, and she continued to have bleeding and discomfort. So her doctor used ringed forceps to remove her ineffective IUD. Then he used the forceps to reach in, grasp, and remove any loose material he could from her womb. Last, he gave her five days of the drug methogen, 
Methargen causes the uterus to expel remaining birth tissues to minimize bleeding and risk of infection. But her stomach kept growing and several doctors didn't believe it was a normal pregnancy. So mom wanted whatever it was surgically removed. Fortunately for me, her OB doctor urged her to wait. I guess you could say I survived a miscarriage and an abortion. Well, impressive, man. Yeah, well done. This was, uh, th this was sort of the foundation mm -hmm. of the way the Lord showed me that I know you by name. Yes. And Psalm 139 says that he planned every day in your life before yes. there was one of them. Yes, yes. And, and the, yeah. the famous verse that you covered me in my mother's womb. In my mother's womb, yeah. You know, it's, it's an amazing um, uh, reflection that yeah. I want to live every moment yeah. to, to thank the Lord for the chance to live. Yeah. I should have had missing limbs, arms, legs, fingers, and toes mm -hmm. with those forceps coming in. And, right. and when that doctor was pulling out all that birth material, there's no way that the doctors could have known she was still pregnant because there was no ultrasound yes. in those days. In those days, sure. And, uh, and the doctor actually emailed me a couple years ago. His name is Dr. Richard Paul. He's uh -huh. retired now. And he remembers my case. <laughs> he was responsible for over 300,000 baby deliveries mm -hmm. in his career as, yeah. as the chief of OB at LA County Hospital. Uh -huh. He says, your case remains unique. Wow. And he remembers collapsing in the exam chair next to the exam table. Mm -hmm. and he heard my heartbeat for the first time. Powerful. Powerful. So I praise God yeah. for life. How old were you when you were given the understanding of, 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 of your circumstances of your birth? I was probably, I didn't understand it at the time, mm -hmm. seven, eight years old. Okay. Yeah. You can't process all that. Right. Yeah. But yeah. in my early adulthood after college, when I, when I started on the journey of looking, praying, God, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Got into the business world and was in the large corporate settings, small business settings, running my own business for a period of time. And in, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness of life and going through some disappointments, finding out that God even, you know, he's more concerned, just as concerned with your, your broken heart, your disappointments as he is with life and death matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he met me there as well. And, and I think it was in that context of my early adulthood when the story of my birth actually started to scream out loud, yeah. you know, praise the Lord with your life yeah. and give him everything. Praise God. And I'm going to tell another story later about another promise I made to mm -hmm, God mm -hmm. to save my life. Excellent. You touched on and, and a, a sensitivity to the Lord at an early age. So for me, the logical question is, did you kind of play it straight all through or did you kind of have wilderness years? You know, did you, and, and most people do, many people do. Yeah. Did you follow that path or were you kind of, did you kind of stay straight the whole time? You know, I, I, I tell people, I don't, I wouldn't say that I have any kind of dramatic prodigal son story. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, the devil can see in the unseen realms of uh, the fourth dimension, and he knows the ones who have a heart for God. Yes. And so he's tried to destroy me throughout my life. Mm. And, uh, and I did ultimately go through a painful divorce at one point. Mm -hmm. But God met me in that place, and he took something that was broken, and he made something beautiful out of it. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was out of that wilderness experience that God led me into to media production yeah. on a full-time basis. Mm, mm -hmm. It was a platform to help to offer hope to, to hurting people, and I'll share a few of those projects that yeah. we worked on to help yeah. offer hope to the people out Praise there. Praise God. Now, you're a West Coast guy, California guy, 60 miles or so east of L.A. Was the, the media movie thing kind of always in your DNA, or was that something you developed later on in life? That's a good question. See, I, I loved cameras from the time I was a kid, uh -huh. uh, and and I and I loved the Bible uh, even earlier than cameras. Mm -hmm. and the the stories of the Bible were very very vivid to me. Um, so, yeah, I loved cameras. Loved playing with them every time, uh, and and also the fascination with production and how it all fit together. Mm -hmm. Stories. I loved stories. Uh, there was a one of our films was showing on TV. I got a call from my aunt. Uh, recently, and she said, "Hey, uh, I started laughing out loud when I saw your film." I said, "Why is that, Aunt Maureen?" She said, "Well, because I remembered you as a four-year-old. You were the one that walked around with a hairbrush trying to interview everyone in the room." 
<laughs> you know, so so God apparently wired yeah. into my DNA. And mm -hmm. for those who are watching, yeah. who are wondering, you know, what is your plan for me, Lord? What yeah. do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. um, really thinking and praying over your childhood and the things you dreamed about, the things that you play, even games that you played. Yeah. Um, are, can be very helpful in, in yeah. sensing what it is the Lord created yeah. you to do. I've always said, look at the things that come natural to you, the things that you're gifted for, the things that you, you began to do in your early years. Mm -hmm. At the intersection of your natural talents and gifts and your love for Christ, that's where, that's where you ought to be. Great that's Lord. where you're planted yeah. and that's where you grow. Um, ha having said that, was media, well, let me ask you this question. Was was, was it always in your mind to produce films or just television? Or, and the reason I ask this is because there was a time when we as a church said, stay away from media. Stay out of that arena because God's not there. Um, was there any dissonance in your life because you got this natural bent? Or could you see or did the Lord give you the vision that, hey, I can use this stuff for the building of the kingdom? Yeah. I think God withheld the... Um the outworking of this opportunity for a period of time until mm -hmm. until I could learn some things in life, particularly uh, a growing understanding, a knowledge of His Word, mm. and a personal experience with my Creator yeah. that would ground me mm -hmm. to the point that I would not be... Uh, when you serve the Lord, sometimes you work on a shoestring budget, mm -hmm. and you don't always have uh, a lot of a lot of financial support from the world to do what you're called to do. Yes, and I think that endurance, you know, like Moses endured as him who see who mm -hmm. saw the invisible. Mm -hmm. Um, I needed to have a personal context, I think, before the Lord mm. led me into my ultimate desire. Understood. And to take, to take the love of the Bible and take the love of media and have this, this perfect storm come together yeah. in a way that God, it would honor God mm -hmm. as opposed to fulfill my own personal desires, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like the yeah. Psalms say, you know, make the Lord the desire of your heart mm -hmm. and He will give you everything else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's crucial. And I like what you said, because without that grounding, you're in an arena that can take you far afield. Right. You know, there is money to be made doing what you do away from God. So one, you need the grounding to stay focused on your mission. And, <laughs> and two, when offers come and people see your work and they say, well, hey, here's some bucks doing this. You can say, no, I'm going over here because this is where God is leading me. Right. So you need that first before you begin to build your superstructure. You need that foundation. Obviously, you waited till you got that before you ventured out. Yeah. 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 And, and, and also the other thing I would tell people from my own experience is it's been fascinating to see how everything in my, in my past business career, nothing's been wasted. Mm. In God's economy, yeah, he does nothing that. is yeah. wasted. Mm -hmm. The business career, the accounting, the finance background, the marketing skills, all of those things. Ministries are also businesses. And so many mm. ministries start without having a structure. In place. Yes, yes. So I praise God that I had a business background. And when God led me into ministry, mm. there was a certain structure that took place with prayer. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's been that's been a, a, a huge blessing. Praise the Lord. So the, so the actual soup to nuts, technical abilities of making films, that's part of what God uh, gave me the, 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 uh, the experience in doing. You asked me, how, did I start, did I just dive right in and do film or did it start with television? And the quick answer is, is the, the first thing that I did was my local church invited me to help start a talk show Very cool. for <laughs> young adults. And it was called Hope on Fire several years ago. Uh -huh. well, uh, that show ended up becoming, it started on radio and then became a TV talk show for a period of years. Mm -hmm. And out of that, Livestreams Media was born. Uh, I see. Uh -huh. And uh, the documentary production and the film production was mm -hmm. sort of what God put on my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll share about Single Creek, our first film. Yeah. Uh, when, yeah. I don't know if we're going to go to a break. but Yeah, we're going to go to a song. But before we do that, I want to ask you, define for me what a short film is? Because it doesn't necessarily have to do with the length of the film, but define what a short is. Because that's your, your belly work. That's what you do. You do short films. Um, what is that? Well, short films technically are anything shorter than 45 minutes in a film festival circuit. Uh -huh. um, the truth is our documentary films are made for, made for television, 53 minutes to 59 minute runtime. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's sort of in the no man's land, the gray zone of, yeah, of yeah. short versus feature film. Mm -hmm. feature, technically a feature film is 90 minutes plus. Yes. 
but uh, for documentary format, uh, anything longer than 45 minutes sometimes is considered uh, a feature. A feature, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there are some, not hard and fast rules, but there are some general expectations when you talk about a short, mm -hmm. uh, a short film. Mm -hmm. Define for our audience what a documentary is. Yeah, these are generally interviews that are intended to do journal, a journalistic nature mm -hmm. where <clears throat> um, <clears throat> almost everybody starts with an idea and they, they want to go develop an idea and find people that are knowledgeable in a field or maybe somebody has a personal story that happened to them and a documentary and a producer wants to go <clears throat> and interview them and create a story or a film around their story. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that we've, we've, our three films that we've done so far kind of touch on both. Uh, some are issue driven where you go and you interview people that are experts in a field mm -hmm. and then, you, and then you, you, you develop the whole film around an issue yeah. to try to drive social consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, you try to impact your culture based on um, the calling and not everybody has a, a lily white uh, sense uh, agenda, right? Right, CIA? right. Yeah. I mean Hollywood has an agenda. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, uh, we as Christians have a calling. We have a mission. And so, yes, we have an agenda. Yes. And so, therefore, I'm unapologetic that uh, the documentaries that we produce are intended to, to, create a, to create a context through storytelling, whether it's an issue driven or mm -hmm. whether it's personal testimony. Yes. Or somebody's t sharing their journey. And, uh, and I'll break that down um, around issues versus personal story. But uh, like Single Creek is issue driven. It's mm -hmm. a very awkward sort of topic in the Christian church that's marriage and family centric. Mm -hmm. And if you're 40 plus and you've never been married, uh, something must be wrong with you, CA. <laughs> we gotta fix you. <laughs> Right? So that's sort of an issue driven example Understood. of what we were going out there to, to produce. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well said, well said. I want to get into, because we're going to talk about your, your contact with the, the late Roger Monod's foundation and some stuff that has come out of that that is very exciting. Uh, and some other stuff that you're doing that led up to that. I think we'll go to our music now, which comes to us from Valerie Shelton Walker. And she's going to be singing My Tribute.
Amen, and thank you, Valerie Shelton Walker. Well done. My guest is Chris Lang, he of Livestream Media, a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker. We touched on, uh, uh, Chris, a little bit about Single Creek and When Morning Breaks, which sort of came out of a pretty dark time in your life, yeah. but God used those for good uh, to be the, the sort of muse for these two particular uh, films. Give me just a quick rundown on, on those particular works, if yeah. you would. Absolutely, CA. Single Creek actually was our first film, and in, in many respects, it's going to always be special to me mm -hmm. because it really created a platform to offer hope to single adults that are out there. You know, uh, U.S. Census data tells us that 100 million single adults now represent half of all U.S. households. Mm. And that's the, the never married, the divorced, the widow, mm -hmm. the uh, single parent, mm. uh, the person struggling with same-sex attraction who's living a life of celibacy. Mm. You know, there, there's a voice out there through this film for those single adults mm -hmm. to challenge the church to see singles differently ah. and to challenge singles to live a life full of faith through mm -hmm. their talents for Praise Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So it, it, it also surprises married people, by the way, because it <laughs> uh, reminds all of us that our completion in our lives comes mm -hmm. from one source, and it's not our spouse. Amen. Colossians 2.10 says that you are complete, complete in, him. in Him. Praise God. Well said. So that's Single Creek. Mm -hmm. uh, when morning breaks, uh, many people feel like it's an extension or a follow-up film to Single Creek. Uh, because the, the Christian church is not only marriage-centric, but also family-centric. Very much so. And mm -hmm. uh, for those couples that are out there watching who haven't been able to have children, mm -hmm. they might feel marginalized sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, those who've had miscarriages, they might feel like God can't trust them to be parents. Yeah. And, of course, the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. um, for, for women who've had abort, post-abortive women, mm -hmm. feel like they didn't have any choice. Mm -hmm. And so where are their self, uh, safe places and churches for them to talk about such yeah. things? Yeah. So When Morning Breaks is really a film about hope. It's, uh, you know, people say, well, it's got miscarriage and abortion uh, stories shared in it. But, you know, CA, one of the things that I've learned is that the long-term emotional impact of either kind of pregnancy loss, regardless of the cause, mm -hmm. can be long-term and they can often, often be very similar. Sure. But in the context, uh, for all of us, we can see in a lens through these stories that we all need healing and we mm -hmm. all need a savior. Mm -hmm. So uh, these, these have been our first two documentaries, really social issue driven, mm -hmm. but also helping to create conversation in the church. Yeah, praise the Lord. Now, it, are these still available? They are. Yeah. They're available on digital platforms like Amazon Prime and okay. Google Play and mm -hmm. also uh, on our ministry website as Okay, well. so we can get the stuff and we'll, and we'll put that information up later. What I gotta ask you now, because we gotta yeah. go hustle along, yeah, yeah. Um, your, your road to filmmaking was not a direct road. You've done a lot of stuff which actually kind of prepared you for the ministry that you now carry on. I mean, God has taken you through some, through some things. Did you go to school for your filmmaking? Did you pick it that skill up along the way with all of the other things you're doing? Because your resume is pretty, pretty broad. Yeah, that's right, CA. Um, actually, it was, it was um, in the field learning. Uh -huh. I didn't actually go to school for film production. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you love, when you sense a great story, mm -hmm. when, you, when, you feel that, when you feel that conviction, it's really learning the technical tools, you mm -hmm. know, the shooting, the yeah. editing, the col color correction, the audit, the, uh, the music, making yes. sure you understand how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. And with God's blessing, yeah. uh, these films are, are, are being shown worldwide. Praise God. And uh, we're so, so thankful for the opportunity to, to tell these stories. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not just telling other people's stories, mm -hmm. and that's the wonderful context when, yeah. when you remember that God saved your life, too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that you become this sort of outgrowth yeah. of, uh, yeah. Storytelling. So all of this is filtered through that. Um, I have a friend that says, you know, if you got the fastball, we can teach you the other things. Exactly. You know, so you, you've got to have the basic understanding of what a story is and how to tell it. The technical stuff right. you can pick up. Mm -hmm. But if you got the fastball, I can teach you the curve and the slider. Exactly. But you got to have the fastball. So obviously you had the fastball and the other things you picked up along the way. And God prepared you and took all of that put it in a pot and out came ministry, which we praise the Lord for. Talk about this last one, the latest and greatest. Yeah, this, this, this project is called About Miracles and um, it was such a joy to put together. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, a, we have a, a short uh, trailer that we want to show to give a context for, mm -hmm. for uh, what these stories present. All right, let's watch it. What if you were robbed at work and then shot in the head?
Or what if a blood vessel in your brain was about to rupture and you didn't know it? What if you had to earn thousands of dollars in one week for a mission trip? Or what if you were going blind and prayed for healing that never came? Sometimes you need a miracle. And sometimes the only logical explanation is God. Love it. See, I'm in line already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there to watch it. Walk me through a little of what we're going to see when we, when we buy that DVD. Well, there are four stories, as you saw really quickly in that, in that trailer. The first story is, is about a man who was working at a convenience store, and he was robbed and shot in the head at point-blank range mm. and left for dead. Uh, the, it, it was amazing, the little clip you saw there in the trailer. God actually opened the door for us to reenact that, uh, that scene mm -hmm. in the very store where he was attacked. We, wow. also, mm -hmm. we also got uh, security camera footage uh, and interviewed the surgeon that operated, operated on him the mm -hmm. very night he was shot. Three feet from his head with a 45 caliber pistol, wow. went through his ear and ducked down and broke his mandible, mm. went spun through his neck, and you have jugular and carotid artery, sure. you have your esophagus, you mm -hmm. have your spinal column, yeah. missed all of that, wow. and you saw the scar in the trailer, yeah. just a scar. Yeah. It's a badge for this man, Brian. Mm -hmm. He gets to tell his miracle story everywhere yeah. he goes. Yeah. No neurological deficits. 92% of the people who are shot in the head will die. Yeah. Wow. So the second story that you saw in the trailer is a woman who, who had an, a brain aneurysm. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating about her story, CA, is that God spoke to her when she was on the phone one night and told her to go to the emergency room when she had no physical symptoms at all. Wow. She obeyed. Wow. Mm -hmm. And because she obeyed, yeah. her life was saved. And that's a, an, an amazing story. The yeah. third story is a, a girl who wanted to go to China on a mission trip and mm -hmm. she didn't have the money. So she was a call porter, and she had to sell an exact number of books on four days' time to earn the thousands of dollars to go on that trip. And it was a really fun short story to do in that. Yeah, movie. yeah. God cares more uh, about uh, all of these kinds of temporal concerns, yeah. and this really, really illustrates mm -hmm. how passionate and wonderful our Lord is wow. to, to inter intercede in even such a simple thing that's not life and death. Yeah. Last story, uh, Neville Peter. Many of our viewers know who he is. Oh, yeah. He's a songwriter. Been here many times. Mm -hmm. Wonderful man of God. Mm -hmm. Heard him talking one day. I was looking for my fourth story, and uh, I, I, I heard the Holy Spirit whisper to me, talk to Neville. He's a miracle, too. And it didn't dawn on me until after I interviewed him mm -hmm. what the Lord was trying to say through a blind man's testimony. Yes. And I understood that God wants the world through this film to see that the greatest miracle of all mm -hmm. is, the, is the miracle of a transformed heart. Praise God. Neville, yeah. you see, Neville doesn't, doesn't have uh, some uh, pull it up by the bootstraps, positivity, mm -hmm. with a, mm -hmm. get a self-help book uh, mentality. Yeah, yeah. He believes in his creator that has a transformative mm -hmm. impact in his life, and it really shows. Yeah, it does. It does. comes across in all so, of you. Uh, so that, that's, that's a little yeah. snippet of yeah. all four yeah. stories. Let me ask you this, Chris. How do you get your stories? Do people bring you stuff? Do you go out looking for things? Do uh, ideas brought to you, things pitched to you? How do you, how do you get your, your material? All of the above, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Emails, phone calls, yeah. and, uh, and sometimes, like in this case, as I say, as the Lord is my witness, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, mm -hmm. talk to Neville, he's a miracle too. Wow. So even the Lord has led directly mm -hmm. to some of these stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how very, very exciting. The latest uh, venture of yours, uh, talk to us about how you came into contact with the Roger Morneau estate. I happen to have read, I think, everything that was written about him and, and all, of his, all of his works. So when I heard that you were working with that, that, it piqued my interest. But walk us through that time and what is coming out of that, that contact. Sure. Um, recently, I had read all of Roger's books, and I was impressed, CA, that I had never seen a, a dramatic presentation of his conversion story in mm -hmm. 1946. I mean, anyone who's heard about Roger Morneau yeah. would not disagree yeah. that it must be one of the greatest conversion stories of oh, the yeah. 20th century. Yeah. For those who haven't, 
give us some, some culture, some background, some context for Roger. As a young lad, mm -hmm. Roger could not harmonize the teachings of his church, he grew up Catholic, mm -hmm. with those of the Bible. He, he came to believe that God was a tyrant, mm -hmm. and he turned his back on God and religion completely. Later, he was invited into a secret society that promised him wealth and power. Yes. But even though he was charmed by spirits and teachers, he never felt peace or joy. He, he, he found out firsthand that demons are real. Oh, yes. And that their work is based on deception. Uh, he's being pressured by the satanic priest in that group to join, to be initiated on Halloween 1946. One night he's laying in bed. It, by the way, his parents had warned him not to play with evil mm -hmm. and that someday you're going to pay the price. Yep. Uh, and he also knew that no one had ever gotten out of that secret society alive. Mm. So there he is at night. He can't sleep at 3 a.m. He's staring up at the ceiling. And he hates, remember, he hates God. He's turned his back on God, but he shouts up to the ceiling, if there's a God in heaven that cares for me, help me. Mm. Several days later, he met Cyril Gross at the embroidery factory where he worked. Yes. And he soon learned during that day that Cyril was a pretty religious man. Mm -hmm. And he came to find out that Cyril kept the Bible Sabbath. And so that very night, he asked if he could study the Bible with Cyril and his wife, Cynthia. Mm. And within seven days, they had covered 28 Bible studies. Wow. And he gave his heart to the Lord instead of that very week selling his soul to the devil, mm -hmm. which is what he was supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. Because Roger was not a toe in the water kind of Satanist. He, he dove in hook, line, singer, whatever metaphor you want to use. He was deep into, into that, was he not? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, but God knew his heart and mm -hmm. God knows the viewers that are out there, people who have, who have not, who have not grown up with a, with a clear understanding of the heart of God and the mm -hmm. truth of his word. Um, he knows the people that have been deceived and he knew that about Roger. Yes. You yes, see, yes. I believe that this story is so timely for today, CA, mm -hmm. because m many of the people who are leaving Christianity and going to the none of the above category, mm -hmm. they're not going to Buddhism and they're going to the none of the above Correct. category. Correct. Yes. Because religion has failed them. Mm -hmm. Well, it failed Roger too. And if people could hear and understand how the Creator God reached down into the darkness to save mm. this man's life mm -hmm. when he hated God. Yes. But God understood that he was deceived. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's so fascinating about this story, the opportunity to now, uh, we, we actually uh, signed a, a development agreement with Roger's estate. Roger passed away in 1998. Oh, yes. And uh, our original idea was to, to pr develop a feature film and as we were reading the unpublished manuscript of his first book, A Trip into the Supernatural, mm -hmm. we found out that there was so much more of his story that had never been published. Uh -huh. And so, uh, by God's grace, we were convicted that the, 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 that the world should see mm -hmm. the whole story. Sure. And so, uh, this, this book um, actually came out recently mm -hmm. that includes the full manuscript, the full story of his conversion in 1946. Wow. And not only his childhood and his World War II experience, but also some incredible ways that God taught him to pray after he gave his heart to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My question to you as a filmmaker, you, you, you read this massive material on this very complex and layered life. Um, how do you then digest that into something that we can watch that that tells a story yet is not incredibly long that holds our interest. How do you begin to attack that to make it something that we, we want to see? Yeah. There's a thousand different ways a story can be told, right, CA? Uh-huh. Uh, <clears throat> the, the feature film originally was designed to be focused on primarily his childhood experiences, the ways that he, that he was informed in his Catholic upbringing, mm -hmm. and then the way his twig was bent. You see, his mother died when he was 12 years old. Yes. And, and that was the straw that broke the camel's back for Roger. Mm -hmm. So our focus was really going to be on the secret society and on how he was delivered by the Lord. See, there was a confrontation with a, with a high-ranking spirit one night. At, mm -hmm. On the week when he was studying the Bible, a spirit confronted him in his bedroom one night. Mm -hmm. And this is really the climax of the movie. In my heart, I could, I sensed that the Lord wanted, wanted to show that doesn't, you know, Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, Matthew right. chapter 16, mm -hmm. and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, uh -huh. right? So even if the devil himself comes to a new child of God mm -hmm. and tries to shout, and, and that's what was happening that night mm -hmm. in Roger's bedroom. Yeah. And in the name of Jesus, Roger 
Roger told that spirit to leave in the name of Jesus. And that spirit left and slammed the balcony door open so hard it just about put a hole in the plaster wall. Wow. So when you ask me, how do you tell the story so that people will care? Mm -hmm. Well, first you have to tell a story that makes, it can't just be an information dump. Right. People aren't going to be interested if you're yeah. information dumping and trying to preach at them. Yeah. You have to engage them at the point where they're going to care about this character, Roger Morneau. Mm -hmm. so, so developing empathy as you go along in your story mm -hmm. in the script and then, and then building up to a climax, there's a certain structure that typically a film should follow yes. in order to actually bring people on a journey. Mm -hmm. it, it, people have to want to care about someone first. And secondly is, what is it that that person cares about? It has to be a universal concern. Understood. And, and so in the story, you have to build what is that universal thing that your character is seeking. Mm. And throughout the story, there has to be a thread. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that. yeah. that's ultimately what, what we're working on. We don't have the script finished yet. Uh -huh. And we, we, that, that's part of what we're praying about. Yeah. So we have the book, the documentary interviews. We, we have, actually, it's a three-part project, see? Mm -hmm. It's the book. It's a documentary that features interviews with yes. family, friends, and former members of the occult, uh -huh. and this feature film. Wow. And so each of them are their own pieces, mm -hmm. and the, the script for the feature film is yeah. something we're still praying about. It's going to be an expensive project. <laughs> but, you know, you yeah. said something. This, the theater today is the, is the postmodern church. Mm -hmm. People are increasingly going there to find their truth. And this story, by God's grace, mm. we want to present... We want to help people understand why truth matters today mm -hmm. and that the great controversy is real. Yes, yes. I'll give you an example. There's a certain sound to this story, C.A. <laughs> I, was, I, I, was, uh, I was in a big city and I was looking for, to see if we could use their trolley system as uh, exterior shots for our, for our film. Sure. So I met with the transit authority and they brought me into their office. I'm sitting there talking to these powerful people. And I'm, I'm a nobody. I'm not from Hollywood. Yeah. But they're treating me, you know, with respect. Yeah. And they said, listen, we don't, we don't, we do this a lot. We, we rent our subways, our buses, our trolleys to Hollywood producers all the time. But we don't always agree because sometimes it could create a bad image for our city. Uh -huh. So she leans forward in her chair and she asks me, what's your movie about? Now... When you don't know somebody's <laughs> worldview, CA, right, you yeah. don't know if they're Christian, or right, Muslim, yeah. or agnostic. Yeah, you don't want to lay it on too thick. You don't want to, you know, pour honey on them. But so yeah. it was a Nehemiah thing, you know. I, yeah. I said I prayed to the Lord, and I said uh -huh. to her, "It's it's a story about Roger Morneau, a former demon worshipper who became a Christian author and prayer warrior. It it happened in 1946." And that's the reason why we want to lease your trolleys for exterior shots because their trolleys actually were, were, were manufactured in 1947. Wow. And they're operational wow. out on the streets. Incredible. In that Good really amazing. Yeah. So I, I said to her, I said, you know, this story is true. And I said, I'm going to interview the very people who studied the Bible with him in 1946. They're almost 90 years old. Mm. And I said, those people were almost killed by spirits. They were witnesses. Yeah that uh, there's a battle going on over every person alive today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, I'll, I'll never forget how big her eyes were. Sure. She was leaning forward in her chair. She grabbed her, her file of paperwork and she started going over. She said, that sounds fine to me. <laughs> and she started going through the pricing and the contract and yeah. everything. She gave me her card. She says, call, call me. This sounds great. Praise we want to see Lord. the script when it's done. You know, we plan, the Lord planted a seed there. Yeah. And, and uh, I also ran into a, a president in that same city of a company we work with. Mm -hmm. They're not Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And he took me out to lunch. He knows that I'm working on this project about Roger Morneau. Mm -hmm. And he knows that it's more about, it's, it's about more than just being delivered from demon worship. Uh -huh. uh -huh. it, it, Roger learned about the Sabbath. He learned about the state of the dead. Mm -hmm. And, and what's, what's amazing is that this Sunday Protestant and all of his staff, <laughs> they're praying for this project. See? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praying for this project yeah. that the Lord will open yeah. the doors for. Let me ask you this, Chris, before our time slips away, because Roger... In, in reading his material, dealt with some dark stuff. How do you walk that line between telling the truth about his life and not degenerating into sort of a sci-fi kind of spook kind of thing? Halloween. Yeah, yeah, kind of Halloween kind of caricature kind of a thing. You know, that's been a topic of a lot of prayer. Yeah. You know, we, we, the 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 challenge that we don't want to glorify the darkness. Precisely. We want to lift up Christ. Mm -hmm. 
And for, for the sake of those people, like Jesus, when he went across the sea and he ran into those demon-possessed men mm -hmm. in Gennesaret, right? He told that man, go tell your friends and family what great things the Lord has done for you. Yes. And how is he, that man had never heard Jesus preach before. Mm -hmm. He could only tell his conversion story. Right. And, and, and it's very graphic in the Bible. He was cutting himself. Mm -hmm. He was chained. He was breaking chains. Right. He was so demon-possessed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, the Bible tells us in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that it's, it's, it's sad that we should even have to speak of these things. Mm. And then Paul says that we are to expose the darkness and, of course, putting on the whole armor of God in chapter 6. Yes. But it is, um, it, it is, it's, it, it's a challenge to present the story, to validate that the darkness is real. It's like if I were to give a slogan, I would say the darkness is real and God is awesome. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the slogan is mm -hmm. because Jesus is the lead character the devil, of course, is part of the great controversy, but he's defeated. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in order to be truthful to Roger's story, yeah. we, we have to validate that the darkness is yeah. real. That's the tension that all right. exists. And I'll tell you a quick story, not take up your time. But when, when I was writing my third book, uh, it, there was a, a scene of a, a young lady. She's an Adventist. She's Christian. She has a secret crack habit that she confided to me. And uh, we were writing the, the story. Well, she says it's Friday night. I'm out, I went to get crack, and I told a guy I got no money, so I have nothing to give you. He said, yeah, you do. And she said, the way he looked at me, I knew what he wanted. So she said, 10 minutes later, I'm on the ground, and my dress is up, and a man is on me and in me. In three hours, I'm gonna be in church. All this for drugs, I don't even know this guy's name. So when I submitted the book, they said, you can't put that in there. Uh, and we fought over that, because I said, in order to, to, to glory in her healing, I gotta show you where she came from. So if we sanitize that, then we lose the legitimacy of her, of her ascent. Well said. Yeah, you know, so we gotta, we gotta show that. Well we don't wanna glory in that, we don't wanna wallow in that, but that's part of her life, like her now being in the church and being clean and being whole is part of her life. So you can't, you gotta have, you gotta have both. So it occurred to me that that's one of the, the tight ropes you gotta walk we got to tell the truth about where this guy came from so that you can see that if someone else is down there too, they also got the hope. And as a filmmaker, you, you got to do that in a short period of time, but you got to make that point. That's exactly right. Yeah. Very well said, CA. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Roger's intercessory prayer ministry is greatly remembered. He, a lot of his books were about prayer. Very much But so. they were informed by his knowledge of having been deep in yeah. the darkness. Well said, yes. You yeah. see, yeah. Yeah. that's the reason why mm -hmm. God used him in such a powerful way to illustrate the power of intercessory prayer mm -hmm. because he understood the rules of engagement mm -hmm. between the, the darkness and the light. And he articulated it in a way that only the Holy Spirit could. Amen. So I agree with you. I think this is um, Mary Magdalene. You mm -hmm. know, healed from seven demons by Jesus himself. Yeah. What a dramatic depth that he pulled her from. Precisely. And how, how in the world would we have a context that, that Jesus is relevant today mm -hmm. unless we, as you said, tell where someone really came from? Yeah, yeah. Do you write, as far as script writing, do you write your own stuff or do you have a, a group of people write for you, write with you? How do you, how do, you do that? With the documentary production, um, the Lord and I do that uh -huh. in post-production. Most documentaries don't have a script. Yeah. But in this new project we're talking about, we're, we're putting together a team. Uh, there's a number of different script writers that I'm mm -hmm. talking to right now mm -hmm. who are praying about and talking and seeing yeah. who the Lord has in store to write the script for the Praise screenplay. The Lord. Praise the Lord. It must be very, so very exciting. First of all, I, I, I like film, I like movies, and I like, I like the documentary format. So it must really be exciting to bite down on something that's big and that has consequence and that can change lives. Yes, no? Yeah, this is, yeah. Th th this is exciting. Um, I, I believe that we're in the final stages of Rose history, brother. Mm -hmm. Well said. And, you know, Martin Luther, William Tyndale, John Wesley, all these great reformers, mm -hmm. they, 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 they uh, broke, broke free a lot of truth in their era, but they weren't able to, uh, to show all truth. They, they, the, the, the truth of the Sabbath and the state of the dead were things that they didn't understand back then. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a final mission to finish the Protestant Reformation because the protest is not over. Amen. You know, and Roger's story is so beautiful and it's like this call to come out of Babylon mm -hmm. because 
you know, CA, the thread that runs through all worldviews, except for a precious few of Christians and Seventh-day Adventists or one of those mm -hmm. subcultures that understands that death is asleep. Um, it's, it's the immortality of the soul, uh, this, mm -hmm. this belief that, that you pass on in some form or another after you die, whether it's Freemasonry, witchcraft, mm. uh, whether it's uh, most of Protestant Christianity, Catholicism, uh, Buddhism believes in Nirvana, yeah. um, Hinduism, mm -hmm. you know, even witches believe in, in Summerland that you go somewhere like a purgatory. It, you know, the devil is so good at sending out all these distractions, thousands of packagings, but it all comes back to the tree. Yeah. It all comes back to the garden. Yeah where the serpent says you will not surely, surely die. die. Correct, yeah. So the yeah. lie is alive and well today. Mm -hmm. God needs a people yeah. who are going to reflect the face of Jesus and show the truth in love. Well said, well said, well said. As you begin to work now uh, on this life, well, first of all, let me ask, this book is available. Yes. Yeah, you can get this now. That's right. Is This is sort of the template for what you're trying to do uh, as yeah. far as this life? Mm -hmm. the, the, the movie script will be based on this book. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're definitely um, seeing this as phase one of our three-part project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, praise God. You're working with the permission, the cooperation, the, the blessing of the Morno estate. Correct. Okay, so this is yeah. legitimate stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had the privilege to interview Roger's grandson recently. Uh -huh. And of course, Cyril and Cynthia Gross, who studied the Bible with Roger in 1946. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's been a great privilege to, to, uh, to work with Roger's family mm. and, uh, and to meet so, so many incredible people that knew Roger. Yeah. Um, I, I actually interviewed a couple in Montreal, Canada, who Roger prayed for. Mm. And she had this miraculous heart recovery when she was actually dying in the hospital yeah. for critical yeah. care. Yeah. Now that was, as you read his material, that was a, an outgrowth of his walk with God mm -hmm. that that guy had the ability to get a prayer through, man. And, and, and get blessings on, on the back end. He really, and I think it was because he had come from so far down, he knew who God was, he knew where God was, he knew how to get to God, and there was a sincerity that marked his, the latter part of his life that was unmistakable. But you know, he wanted so desperately, CA, for the, for the world, for, for believers everywhere, to believe and grasp that you can have a prayer life like he had. Mm -hmm. That Roger was no special uh, guru like they believe yeah. in India and Hinduism. <laughs> that Roger was simply trying to teach us and disciple us and mm -hmm. help us understand that we can all have that passionate prayer life, that intimacy with the Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's his estate wants desperately for people listening and watching this project as it unfolds mm -hmm. to really grasp and believe for themselves. Praise God, praise God. Obviously, Chris, you are very aware of the times in which you live. And that time is not far, there's not a lot of time left. There's much more in the rear view mirror than there is in the, in the windshield. Um, timeline, do you have a, a time when you're trying to get this done and out, or do you kind of just take it as it comes? Because documentaries can be, I mean, you've got to do a lot of research. There's a lot of time at the computer, a lot of time looking up stuff, talking to people, and then you've got to synthesize this stuff. Do you have a, a kind of timeline in your mind? Thank you. Yes, um, the goal with God's help is to release the documentary before the end of uh, 2015. Uh, our goal is it's to um, come out with a feature film by fall, Halloween season 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, we're giving ourselves some time to raise the funds that we need. Yeah. It's going to be a large mountain. Uh, you know, when you do a feature film, you mm -hmm. have a small army that's required. To oh, yes. It. Yeah. You have a lot of location, a lot of... A lot of expense versus mm -hmm. the documentary format, mm -hmm. but we felt like the the, the both programs were very important mm -hmm. uh, in terms of underscoring the importance of this story. So so uh, end of 2015 documentary, and then uh, and then late 2017 for the feature mm -hmm. film, God mm -hmm. willing, yeah, uh, even sooner if possible. But yeah. you know when you think about a countercultural story like this mm -hmm. that happened mm -hmm. during Halloween 1946. And all the films that get released that are spooky, hobgoblins, scary stuff, yeah. uh, horror films at Halloween season, mm -hmm. we want a film that's going to be completely against the grain. Praise God. Praise God. Obviously, you have bitten down on this because you're, you're going to do two projects, one a documentary, one a, a feature film. Right. So you think this is, a, is an important story to tell? Absolutely. Yeah. And I really believe it's part of God's last day call for mm -hmm. people to come out of Babylon. 
and the the documentary itself isn't intended to to duplicate the feature film. The feature film, again, the feature film is not to be preachy. It's not. It can't be uh, didactic. We're not trying to do a Bible study. In right. The film. Right. Right. By the Holy Spirit's blessing, we want to make people curious to learn what Roger learned in uh, 1946 that mm -hmm. saved his soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and you, you actually were heading down the same road because I'm thinking your your target audience isn't a person who's sitting in church on Sabbath anyway. Exactly. That feature film is, is going to be for an audience that doesn't have that predisposition. So it's got to tell a story without preaching the story, yet it, there's got to be some entertainment value because you want people to see it. So you're, you're weaving together a number of threads to try to get something that is 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 relevant and yet that is marketable and that is saleable. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. A lot to say. And also, you know, we're living in a prove it to me age. Precisely, and, yeah. And so yeah. that's why yeah. the documentary is coming out to sort of underscore and validate the person that Roger was mm -hmm. and, and the danger of the occult ultimately. Mm -hmm. That you, when you dabble in it, yeah. it's going to take your life ultimately. Excellent. To stay there. Yeah, well said. Chris Lang is a, a, a representative of a number of, of young people. I still call him young because he's younger than me. Uh, who are who are seizing this medium that is so very very powerful? I, I think video television, one of the most powerful things ever created in the history of the world. He's using this for the uplifting of the gospel. Should you want to make contact with Chris Lang, Livestream Media, support this very very worthwhile and worthy project with your prayers and with your finances. Here's the information that you're going to need. To contact Chris Lang or for more information about his ministry, you can write to Lifestreams Media, Post Office Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860. That's Lifestreams Media, Post Office Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Or call 407-494-3288. That's 407-494-3288 or you can go online at livestreams.org. That's livestreams.org. Hello, I'm Carrie Christian, and we're excited about a new live prophecy series beginning very soon. Revelation Today is a comprehensive study series that will focus on the prophecies of the Bible, especially the book of Revelation. Based entirely on the Word of God, Revelation Today will let the Bible speak for itself and will take series participants on an exciting journey through the major themes of the Bible. You will hear what the Bible has to say about the future, political instability, terrorism, and the economy. You'll also hear what it says about religious confusion, prophecy and the cosmic conflict being fought between good and evil. The speaker for this series is Pastor Ron Halverson Sr., whose story is simply amazing. Growing up on the mean streets of New York City, he became a fighting member of a gang in his youth. But by the grace of God and the influence of one of his young friends who found the Lord, Ron's life was turned around. To date, he has led many thousands of men and women to the Lord through his preaching, and now he will be reaching countless millions of viewers as 3ABN and It Is Written Television team up for Revelation Today. This event will be broadcast live from Ovens Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina, beginning Friday, October 11 at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central. If you live in the area, we invite you to come and attend in person. To reserve your seat, visit revelationtoday.com. That's revelationtoday.com. If you plan to watch the series on 3ABN, please consider becoming a host site for your friends and members of your community. Visit revelationtodaylive.com for details. That's revelationtodaylive.com. Don't miss the powerful opening night presentation entitled, Our Day in Bible Prophecy. It will take us straight to the heart of Revelation and we'll find that the Bible prophecies and the words of Jesus indicate that we're living in the end times described in that book. For a complete listing of times, please visit 3abn.org or check our schedule in the October edition of 3ABN World Magazine.
I want to thank each of you who are making this series possible through your prayers and financial support. And if the Holy Spirit impresses you to support more events like these, please send your tax-deductible gifts to 3ABN, Post Office Box 220, West Frankfort, Illinois, 62896. Thank you for your love and support, and may God bless you in all that you do for Him. And that's good information. Chris Lang, uh, closing thoughts, sort of put a little bow on this for us, if you will. You know, CA, a few years ago I was memorizing Hebrews chapter 11, that great list of the Hall of Faith from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joshua and all of these incredible people. And the Holy Spirit convicted me as I was reciting that passage one day. Chapter 12, verse 2 says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus isn't just the author and finisher of our faith. This is what the Lord impressed me. He's not just the author and finisher of your faith, but he's also the alpha and the omega of history, Revelation 1, verse 8. Mm -hmm. So therefore, he's still writing epic stories to the yes, CA. Yes, well said. And by God's grace, mm -hmm. your story and the viewer's story and mine is part of that great hall of faith. Mm -hmm. And God wants you to believe today that he wants to make an epic story out of your life Amen. and mine. Yeah. And that your life is just as important to him mm -hmm. as Abraham and Moses' life. Yeah, yeah, well said. Christ has a way that he wants that story to end. Uh, and, and, and his desire for your life is that you have a long, good, happy life here. But, th but that ends in a forever life with him in glory. And I'm thankful for people like Chris who are doing what they can to shine the light of Christ's love into the eyes of people who have been in darkness so long that they may not know what real light is and in fact mistake true light for black light. Mm -hmm. So he's giving us the true light. Chris, thank you so very much. Our time has fast slipped into eternity. Allow me now in closing to wish you both grace and peace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye and God bless. <laughs>